Hello and welcome to this Double Bill episode featuring the announcement of what our wonderful patrons have voted for for our next production next year. And then after that, there will be a regular podcast with a lost, discussing episode recorded just before the plague. More on that anon. So, we had a number of really great plays suggested by our patrons, whose votes continue to stack up. Now, due to the plague, we have something of a backlog, and we've been having to change how we record some of our plays as we go forward. We also have a lot of plays that have been suggested that haven't quite hit the numbers of votes, so we've got a lot of plays in the running that all have about the same number of votes and which uh, some sort of decision had to be made. And because we've got such a backlog and uh, we only have so much money coming in at the moment, of course, if you want to become a patron now or uh, donate to us on Kofi.com or or similar, then uh, that gives us more room for manoeuvre and potentially more plays to do in the next year. But at the moment, I'm only promising one new patron choice for the coming season because there's still so much to clear. So we've had new votes this season for Cleopatra by Samuel Daniel, John Baptist's Preaching by John Bale, Lady Lumley's translation of the tragedy of Iphigenia, and Arden of Fathersham by the Unknown, and Two Angry Women of Abington by Henry Porter, uh, Damon and Pythias by the Unknown, and Callisto and Melabea from the press of John Rastel, and a few more texts that didn't quite make the top rank. Out of those plays, a couple stood out in terms of votes, and so it ended up being a choice between The Tragedy of Iphigenia and Arden of Fathersham. And the winner was... Drum roll, please. I would do a drum roll, but I don't have a drum... Lady Lumley and her translation of Iphigenia. But, but, as a consolation prize, we will be workshopping Arden of Fathersham over the next year and putting it in the long-term planning roster along with a game at chess, Thomas of Woodstock, Dido, Queen of Carthage, and the other popular votes we've had so far. All of those, you will note, are big productions, apart from possibly Dido, and therefore we are playing a long game on those. The Tragedy of Iphigenia will complete our first phase of work on the women writing in the pre-Jacobean period. We have essentially a trilogy of three tragedies, with the upcoming releases of the tragedies of Mariam and Antony. There are still more female-led texts to come, Not that many. Um, I use the word female-led to expand our our frame of reference as we go into the Jacobean. But these three plays cover this first phase very nicely, taking uh, taking us up to 1602-ish, I think, with Mariam. I think that's where it generally is dated. Uh, As we go beyond that, and I do want to continue... uh, championing the women who were writing and performing in the early modern period. Uh, As we go forward, we're going to be including a lot more masks. Uh, We've got at least one more full-length play, uh, and there's some other fragments and pieces uh, to do. uh, There isn't that much before we hit the interregnum, which is technically our endpoint, but we're going to try and get everything done that we can. The plan is to record Iphigenia in the spring of 2023, so next spring, and that will then end with a live stream performance of the audio feed for our patrons and a paying ticketed audience for those who are not patrons. And hopefully that will bring in a bit more money to move into the next productions that we go after that. I've provisionally put John Baptist's preaching by John Bale into the stretch goal area should we gain more patrons or support um, over the next few months and if that happens we'd 
probably do the whole Bale trilogy of biblical plays at the same time because they're all quite small cast and quite short and very much within the area of uh, of infilling in our timelines. We're very interested in uh, doing as much of the, uh, the, the, the Henrikian drama, uh, the drama of Henry VIII, uh, uh, and trying to do a lot of that because we've already done done the John Hayward and uh, and other bits and pieces from that period so it's 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 I like the idea of being able to pull all those pieces together and additional commissions and activity will be produced as and when money or opportunities arise because sometimes uh, someone comes to us with a proposal and we go oh yes we can do that and then we do it and more stuff happens and that's sort of where we're hoping to go over the the next few months but uh, as and when uh, money and or opportunities arise more things will be announced but for the moment we can as I say confirm that we're definitely doing the tragedy of Iphigenia as translated by Lady Lumley and we're going to be working in detail uh, over many months on the uh, on the text of Arden of Fathersham as well as the source uh, we've already done some work on that already and uh, there will be more on that coming anon but that ends the first part of this episode. Ooh. Now to the main body of the podcast. And this is a lost discussing episode. Uh, it is either the first or second of these I've released. I've actually forgotten off the top of my head whether I've released any of these yet. Uh, I definitely have to the patrons, but I haven't necessarily released these to the real world. So this is a lost discussing episode. We have recorded lots of inter interviews with lots of people. This is the second. This is I've just remembered. This is the second one that we are releasing to the, the real world on the podcast, which means one of my links is wrong in a later one. Anyway, anyway, we recorded lots of uh, interviews. Um, some of them were delayed just simply because there was technical problems with the recording. Uh, some of them because we were trying to connect it up with other stuff we were doing at the time. This one has been delayed because it was just a bit sad, and it still is a bit sad, uh, because this was uh, an interview with Beth Burns of Hidden Room Theatre, and we were discussing a production of Arden of Fathersham, connected with the first part of this podcast, uh, which was going to be coming to London to be performed, and there was a lot of discussion of future projects happening with Hidden Room Theatre. Sadly, this was recorded just before the plague started. So uh, this production didn't transfer and didn't uh, carry on from where it was at the precise time of recording, pretty much. So this frequently refers to future plans that sadly do not happen. And um, it is... A sad thing to have an interview so filled with hope and promise uh, and it was a lovely interview and I really enjoyed doing it and, uh, and chatting with uh, Beth Burns um, and it shows how much has changed in the world of theatre in the last few years but sadness aside it is a good introduction to the play of Arden of Fathersham and a few others and gives a really good idea of how it functions in performance and of course there is always room for hope that such things may start up again. So with all those caveats aside, off to visit past Robert in the heady days of 2020 and my guest Beth Burns, recorded via the futuristic technology of Skype. Yeesh. I am Beth Burns. I'm the artistic director of the Hidden Room Theatre, currently in Austin, Texas. So, uh, if we could start with... Um, Tell me a little about a bit about the history of, of, of Hidden Room Theatre and your setup because it looks very very interesting from the interweb, from this this distance mm -hmm. uh, distance away. <laughs> um, tell tell me about the, the the setup and what you do. Sure. So uh, Hidden Room was founded uh, by me about ten years ago. Uh, we'll be coming up on our tenth anniversary here in uh, late April. Um, when I first moved to Austin, I think the one thing that I felt like we were really missing uh, was scholarship-based theater. And that was what I happened to be interested in at the time. And so I founded Hidden Room with the hopes of mixing um, my interest for scholarship and, uh, and 
page to stage type work. And also my experience coming from the Groundlings Theater. Um, uh, prior to that, I'd been in Los Angeles working for the Groundlings, which is um, you know, a, a, a well-known comedy, a sketch comedy and improv group. Um, and I had been a teacher and a performer at the Groundlings for about 10 years prior. And I found that um, that early modern theater and, um, and improv um, of that nature actually mixed really nicely together. Mm. And so I was able to sort of take those two passions, uh, bring them together and make Hidden Room. And I also had a third interest, which was immersive, interactive theater, and um, technologically forward-thinking theater. So we still do a little bit of that as well. Um, we primarily work out of a Masonic Lodge here in Austin called the York Wright Masonic Lodge. The Masons have been very kind to us to let us use that quite a bit. And that's been our home. And it's a really great, mysterious kind of place with all sorts of corridors, darkened corridors to go through. And I thought, what a great, <laughs> what a great vibe for a theater. You know, call it the hidden room and and we'll be able to, you know, have a password when people come in and, you know, it traverse this incredibly mysterious building. And eventually you kind of find at the end of your journey throughout the building, you find this beautiful lodge room, uh, it's sort of grand and it has seating on either side. And the nice thing is that sort of also replicates um, an early modern court setting, um, like, you know, like a lot of uh, shows in the, late 15 and early 1600s would have been performed when being performed for royalty and whatnot. Mm. So, um, yeah, so that's what we do. Um, I like to say we make time machines. We started focusing a lot on recreating practices, playing practices that have either been forgotten or dismissed because they're not in fashion anymore. Things like theatrical gesture mm. or, um, you know, or older ways of building characters. Um, and uh, and that's been really interesting to me for a long time. You know, what do you know? A, a deeper sense of original practices mm. uh, to really dig in and see. You know, have we thrown away any useful tools just because it wasn't cool for a while? You know, if you dig in your grandma's closet and you come across a really ace sweater that she thought was gross ten years after she bought it, but you get <laughs> you get far enough away from it and you go, oh this sweater is fantastic. Why are we not wearing it right now? So that's what I do. I, it really interests me because my, uh, obviously what we do uh, is uh, is technologically driven as well as live shows. Um, and my background is in storytelling and clown and it, to some degree improvisation as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that, that that synthesis and connection with, with early modern drama is 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 the direction i was talking to one of my actors today and they were sort of saying oh sometimes you're not a bit worried about not being classically trained and i'm going i'm not classically trained mm -hmm. i have no classical training at all um beyond you know little bits and bobs that one picks up as an actor um it's it's all about how you interact with these texts and make them dynamic and and how texts have room for games and and other other things that are not in the words um and, and we've really found that with with some of the plays we've done mm -hmm. even though we've been working with them primarily as audio um yeah. but you mm -hmm. know constantly looking for what's physically going on and yeah. uh, and plays like gamma Gurton's needle which we we did recently um it's full of physical comedy games it's just full of them and can i piggyback on that and say also mm. you know a big, uh, a big thing that we do at Groundlings is we build character. Uh, we, we do something called making a mountain out of a molehill, right? Mm. Turning a small clue and making that into a big choice, a big emotional choice, a big physical choice, a big character choice. And a lot of that can also be found in early modern texts by the sounds of the words. Mm. So all of a sudden, does the dialogue become clipped? You know, is this character starting to use a lot of Ds and Ts? Do they have a feminine? an ending there or, you know do the words soften out what is the small clue that i can take from this text and make it to a really strong choice and that was another place where i felt like improv uh, really was quite helpful in terms of building and and using um early modern theater um in a way that really makes it come alive um uh, in an exciting way and on top of that you know if you have that same kind of attention that you have when you're improvising mm. uh where you really focus quite quite um, strongly on your scene partners and you're right there and you're never quite sure what they're going to be doing next and you're really yes-anding everything that they give you, 
um, it really makes for a much more enjoyable experience. So I make sure that all my actors, uh, you know, even when they're doing scripted work, that they have a certain amount of freedom. We don't, you know, we block out basically what we're going to do, but but within that, we really give everybody a lot of freedom so that based on whatever choice their partner happens to make that day, that you're really responding to what you get and that you're not just sort of giving off the laundry list. You know, you're not only fresh minting your lines because that's what the character would do as the character's thinking about it, but you, the actor, is really alive and present mm. on stage. And I think without that kind of improv training, you know, actors can feel really, um, really vulnerable in a situation, but with improv training, it's really uh, invigorating and freeing. You mentioned um, gesture acting, and I, I saw it on the website. And uh, before we get to talking about plays and shows and things that you're doing, um, is, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because um, it's something I've I've sort of noticed uh, in passing, but I've not done any work on. Could you could you tell 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 us um, what you've been doing or are doing with that? Absolutely. So um, one of the things, as I said, that I'm most interested in is looking for forgotten playing practices mm. and, um, and gesture work had kept coming back uh, in front of it kept coming to my desk. Right. I'm looking for you know one thing or another and I'm seeing a painting or an engraving and there's the actor involved in gesture or I'm looking into how Betterton created characters and he's talking about gesture. And I thought, you know, if you think about how people if somebody's going to make fun of theater, the first thing they do is they take the back of their hand and they put it up on their forehead and they tip their head back. And this is, uh, and they go, oh, you know, it was like this, right? And isn't it laughable? Mm. Um, but that's just gesture acting, right? That's an actual codified gesture that means despair. And um, and so I thought, well, gosh, you know, if, if people were doing it for so long, um, if it didn't, it only fell out of favor, you know, in the, say, the early 1900s. If people were doing it all the way through then, um, from from the beginnings that we that we know of theater, it must have been effective. People must have liked it. Like, why would we toss it away so completely? So I started looking into it, and I'm, I started realizing that theatrical gesture changes a lot, right? So yeah. the the way that I did it um, with my team, and and I'm incredibly lucky because I work with some of the smartest scholars in the world, and I started this work specifically with Farah Kareem over at the at Shakespeare's Globe and Tiffany Stern, who's currently over at the Shakespeare Institute, mm. two of the smartest uh, at just hero scholars that I that I can think of, and um, and started using their research. And we started, you know, Hidden Room Acts as a laboratory for, for their research. And we start with what we absolutely know, right? What is the kind of theatrical gesture that you and I do on a daily basis, just in our real lives, that's not really theatrical, but that crosses over? Then we cross back into the things that we can um, see from uh, from film when we were still engaged in gesture, then back to silent film, mm -hmm. then back before that we start looking at paintings, then we start uh, reading things that actors are talking about when they talk about gesture. We start looking at actor manuals, how to act um, that explain theatrical gesture. And we hit all the way back into um, John Bulwer's plates on gesture where we have the first codified, this gesture means this, this gesture means this. And he's got it written out basically for uh, one set for people who were um, who had issues with hearing. So it's like the the basis of BSL and um, for actors, another set of play for actors. And we started just going through these plates and trying to figure out, OK, well, you know, how would this really look? And um, and the thing that was most helpful to me, really, uh, beyond Bulwer's plates was finding specific um, essays from actors, the great actors of the day on their own personal processes. Um, so the earliest one that I've, that I've studied is uh, Betterton. And Thomas Betterton was trained by a man who was trained by Burbage. Mm. So when, you know, but when I get a little bit closer to, to today and we start gently working our way backward, so I look at um, Edwin Booth and he talks about his process. And before that, we look at Garrick and he talks about his process. Before that is Betterton. So we can almost sort of like monkey bars kind of gently work our way back in time, starting with what we absolutely know and going back and looking at taste and also looking at, um, at art that surrounds it. So for example, um, you know, not just looking at what actors are saying they're doing, but what other things are out there? What is our current philosophy like at the time? What are we wearing? How's that going to affect gesture? You know, what kinds of philosophy are we reading? What poems are we reading? What's happening to us as a culture? And so we can start to really build a pretty full picture 
paintings, songs, essays, critics, reviews, and what are we not only striving for, but what are we rejecting as a culture? And we start to build what I think is probably a pretty good picture of what this kind of gesture would have looked like. And then when you incorporate that and put it into your process, when you're trying to recreate the playing practices from any one period, you basically make yourself a little time machine. You know, the one thing that doesn't really change is actors, actors' brains. You know, I'm an actor you're an actor. We're actors, whereas other people would hate that. I personally would hate being an accountant. My brain doesn't work like that. <laughs> so actors' brains are basically the same. And the other thing that people often say is, well, you can't ever recreate an audience. Well, sure you can. Uh, the audience is still exactly the same because that's the other bit. Audience brains are still the same. And if you give audiences certain cues into what, um, you know, is this we're going to church, right? You and I decide we're going to go to church together. We can tell what type of church this is based on certain clues that we're being given by the presentation in front of us. Is this the kind of church where I'm going to get up and sing a song and clap? Or is this the kind of church where I'm going to have to be real quiet? And you follow those cues and you're basically the same thing. So we're not, you know, we haven't changed into a different species. We're still just people. And I think ultimately what this is going to tell us is, you know, what does our art say about who we are? How do we present that art? Um, what does that mean for our future? How do we um, take what we what we shouldn't have left behind and learn from it? And how do we connect to our past selves so that we can learn something and so that hopefully we can get better? And you know, you know, that, that there's a thousand adages about this, right? <laughs> it's important to connect to our past selves and to think about this so that we can get better. So that's why I do it. Mm. I mean, that's that's I mean, that's. Oh, really, really interesting. And this, um, I mean, thinking to the some of the work we're doing sort of slightly more under the radar at the moment is we're looking at um, jests, jest books. Oh, okay. Um, so we're looking at the moment of Richard Tarleton, who is somewhere between a stand-up comic and an actor. Um, and there's stories about some of his escapades and some of his reactions with audiences. Mm. And you're getting a real gauge of what, those audiences are like and the kind of games they're playing with him and the kind of improvisation he's doing with them. Um, I mean, he's a, he's a total bastard. Uh, <laughs> he's, his comedy is not nice. It's, you know, it's the kind of thing you'd expect from the 1970s, um, some of it. And But the audience makes as much fun of him as, as he gives back in terms of put-downs. Um, to the point where, in theory, I mean, some of these stories are probably not true. Um, mm -hmm. but there is a story of, of effectively the audience singing uh, like, um, I don't know if there's an, uh, this happens in the, in, in the US, but in the UK, you know, football chants where the crowd is, uh, has, has basically taken a, a standard tune and just written their own lyrics about how useless a player is. <laughs> and uh, there, there, there is an instant, one of the stories is basically he got his clothes nicked and had to go out in, in in his nightshirt uh, one day and they're all going you didn't have your clothes and, 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 and that's coming out of the audience um, <laughs> we, um uh, quite apart from the fact that this story also features the idea that there he had two musicians on tap who woke him up in the morning um and uh, we don't know how that works um at all and that's something i need to do a lot more research on but uh there's basically two fiddle players called fancy and nancy uh would come round in the morning with their their renowned boys and uh would would play him awake and he'd toss them some coins and uh, <laughs> that's that's the distraction that led to having his clothes nicked um now some of that might not be true it's a great story. Oh, it's a great story. Yes. You know, you remind, I've got to read Carlton's Jests. I've never read it. And I, I, is it, it, yeah, that's fantastic. I would love to learn more about that. I hope that I'll find a way to see your work as, uh, as that progresses. And no, we don't have, I mean, I don't see that many sporting events. We just do generally disorganized shouting. Uh, <laughs> but I love the English. <laughs> you guys as a group are really good at uh at putting people down <laughs> <laughs> it's really organized tomfoolery it's well done mm. well as i said <laughs> at the moment we're just working through the the stories but we are looking to do a show where we try and figure out what's the truth and what's not and his different comic personas so hopefully you know there will be something coming out next year uh, uh which will be available on the internet because 
everything we do go everything gets recorded everything gets recorded um and then eventually it gets released when when a slaughter kit appears because <laughs> uh we we already released two podcasts a week and and we oh, wow. yeah we um you know of varying degrees of finishedness right. uh so we do read throughs as well as um you know proper proper full cast audios and uh yeah, you just keep finding things and keep going, oh, that's another one to go on the list. That's another show we're going to do next year. We haven't got any more shows. Uh, <laughs> wow. It's just, it's just so much. And then you get things like Talking Horses, and it's just the things just get weird really quickly when you start diving in the, the apocrypha. Um, yeah. All sorts of strange stuff. Uh, anyway, we should talk about plays. You must be knackered, by the way. You, you having just uh, Arden, having Arden of Fathersham, as has just know. opened or, yeah. or it is opening or you've got through tech or where are you we just opened we had a preview on friday we opened saturday and had a show on sunday now i've got a little bit of a break before we circle back and have more shows on thursday i love this show for every bit of physically tired i am i am emotionally uh just really energized because uh there's nothing i like more than to laugh and i've I've just been in stitches over this show. It makes me laugh so hard. It reminds me of an early modern Coen Brothers film. It's very Fargo. Mm. So for the listeners at home, uh, it's the cheerful, happy story of, of a, an attempted murder that takes a very, very, very long time to reach some form of fruition. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, who doesn't think that bumbling criminals are funny? You yes. know, I personally like I can't I can't handle a film that is too thrilling, mm. <laughs> much less any kind of horror or true crime usually really bothers me. But man, I loves me a dumb criminal, and that's basically what this is. It's just some really stupid murder plans. Um and they get so frustrated that uh, you know, at, at their um their continued failure at trying to murder Arden. Uh, that plans become increasingly desperate and increasingly poorly planned out. Um, and so then, you know, it does, of course, you know, spoiler alert, take a turn when when they finally do get him. Um, oh, and we, isn't that- we'll get upset emails now. You know, oh, you've- <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> well, you know, it's it, uh, unfortunately, it's a true it's a true crime story. So yes. it's already out there, you know, it's. Uh, 1550s, uh, the, the crime happened. We're actually sneaking up on the anniversary. The anniversary of Arden's actual murder is this Valentine's Day. It's February 14. Um, I did notice I th- you had a Valentine's Day special, which I thought was uh, beautifully, beautifully judged. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. You know, passion makes people do all sorts of things, doesn't it? So <laughs> we'll have sort of a, a dark Valentine's Day special. Um, and uh Yeah. Uh, I think it's 463 years since the uh, since the murder, and you know that it had to have really rocked uh, rocked uh, England because the play itself wasn't written until 1592. So mm-hmm. just one of those things that stuck with people. It was written about in the Hollinshed Chronicles, and yeah, stuck with people long enough to not only write a play about it but write a funny play about it. Mm. That means it's good. And it is interesting, actually. Quite a lot of plays um, feature quite badly organized murders. Um, uh, even if they're played more seriously than this, um, it, it it does seem that they did know about the technicality of how difficult it sometimes could be to kill someone, um, because th- there was just so many more opportunities then, um, and so many more of the actors had first hand experience of 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 um, occasionally murdering people. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, there's a line in it. Um, you know, one of the one of these bumbling ruffians basically says, "If only, if only I could turn murder into an occupation uh, without fear of the law." He just, just loves it. <laughs> Murder's so much fun for him. Uh, uh, yeah. So I uh, this play just really uh, it really tickles me. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. And, and to be fair, you know, uh, spoilers again, the, 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 they do get their just desserts at the end. They don't get away with it, people. So, you know, there is a moral. There's a moral. Yeah, like any good comedy, there's a moral. And, um, and that's kind of the wonderful thing about it is that um, they're not only caught, they're caught within minutes. Mm. <laughs> they struggle to kill this man for a month. 
and uh, and then upon fruition are literally caught within minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you just got to plan your murders out better. That's the moral of the story. No, that's not the moral. Murdering people's bad. Yeah. Well, there, there, there is that 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 running that running sense of will they manage it this time? Will they manage it this time? Will mm-hmm. no, no, no. Will 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 he Arden ever die? <laughs> <laughs> not even. And you know, it's got that uh, that great whodunit feel, uh, or that sort of you know campy clue feeling to it because so many people in the town hate this man you yes know, the, the author and or authors have set it up just he is the most hated man in town and he's and he's completely oblivious to this he's very one percenty in my opinion he just doesn't really get it you know read the sailor comes up to him and asks him for a small favor you know you've gotten all this land i'm about to go out um back on on duty back to the sea can you please just leave the land a little tiny patch of land that I have for my wife and children so that they don't go hungry and, you know, without clothing so they don't die impoverished in the street. And Arden's just like, what? No, <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's my land. Like he doesn't even understand. And then he sort of has a line, you know, can, can you believe this guy? He says, this is the railingest name in Christendom. Can you believe this? <laughs> He's just completely clueless to it. Um, yeah, so of course a lot of people want to kill Arden. Yeah, it it does have that m- connection with modern murder mysteries or whodunits where y- you set up the victim who and and everybody hates them because you want to get the idea that any of them could have done it. Uh, obviously, we know <laughs> who's doing it, but it does have that sort of connection um, in in in. in in genre terms, I don't know if that's right. Is it more like a Columbo than anything else? So, well, you know, I, I stand by it. It is almost exactly like Fargo in terms of even, you know, the, the body being drug out in the snow at the end. Mm. Um, has those sort of broad, broadly drawn characters. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't think Columbo's too far away from it. Just sort of Columbo in reverse in terms of, you know, the whole time you're right there, you, you've seen it happen and you get to, <laughs> you, you don't want Columbo to come and figure it all out. But of course he does immediately. Mm. And uh, and to be fair, our, our mayor who comes in and, and solves things at the end, we have sort of modeled him after a Columbo to a certain extent. <laughs> so uh, that is going well. And uh, you have, I, I'm, I expect by the time this goes out, it will all be over. But uh, do you, do you see it possibly coming back again in the future? Oh, what a nice question. You know, I think it might. And um, just because it is so fun and, and for us, it's one of the it's one of the plays that we've done that actually has the fewest actors involved. Mm. Normally we're looking at, you know, a, ca- a cast crew of 16 to 20. Mm. And this one really only has, including musicians, 12. Um, so I know where, the, whereas that's a big, a big cast for other people, for us, it's pretty small. And so I think it does lend itself to touring a little bit better than others. And, uh, we haven't done the Edinburgh Fringe Festival since, uh, about nine years ago, uh, when we went with a, a show called You Wouldn't Know Her, She Lives in London. And on that side of the world, it was called You Wouldn't Know Him, He Lives in Texas. Mm. And it was a Skyped, um, uh, interactive play that we did in two locations at once and then had a third online audience for, uh, so that everybody could kind of be interactive. So it's been long enough that I'd, I'd really like to go back. We might be looking for some various festivals and stuff to go to, especially because the play is, I think, you know, significant culture and not many people uh, get to see it mm. so we might we might take it around a little bit to be fun well i mean uh, it's 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 that thing that it, you're right it isn't actually too massive a cast is it you know and dep- even without adaptation or, or moving things around it is a because it is that quite domestic sphere um mm-hmm. for for you know it's not like you have too many supernumeraries or or extended uh, you know journeyings um except to different potential murder sites um (laughs) (laughs) that is accurate and plus with us because of the way we work we don't need lights Mm. we don't we don't need any of that stuff uh we don't really need special sound effects we take care of all those things on our own Hmm. 
Oh, well, if you do, let me know, and because uh, I'd love, I'd, I'd love to see it. I mean, if you are, do you archive anything in terms of, uh, you know, for for future reference or or the the world? Is 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 that a possibility? I'm always, I'm all all on the archiving things and making it available for others, uh, for the next people who come along. Um, yes, we do, as a matter of fact, and um, uh, our our last several shows are available online on our website. Uh, we've got um, I need to I need to uh, unpassword some of them. I think some of them have been passworded, unfortunately. Uh, but our um, our last few shows, uh, the Rover by Afro Ben, um, is uh, is archived. Yeah, we've got a bunch of our stuff. I need to make sure that that's more available. Uh, to people because you know it ain't going anywhere yeah we've got it all oh. i think only one or two that we um for various reasons didn't manage to get recorded but almost there, all of our shows are because mm. um that that's that's the 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 lovely potential that we have now is that you know the the problem is always trying to sell these shows and trying to sell them to not just to new audiences but to new artists and the next the next people who come along um, and you know, when you the best you've got is here is a printed text that is not very well edited that has been sitting on a shelf for hundreds of years, um, or is you know is just not really available, and that's your starting point. That it it it's sort of just constantly setting plays up to fail um, or not to happen, and trying to find easy routes in for people is sort of is sort of my bag, as it were. Oh. I, I might then add, you know, um, our, our very last show actually was Duchess of Malfi. Mm, yes, well, we, we were about to move on to, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and that'll be, um, you know, it's just being edited down now, um, and we will have that one available online. Yeah, and then we're taking it to Shakespeare's Globe. We're taking it to the Wanamaker in June. We're also taking it to the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon, and also um, uh, the King Edward Grammar School in Stratford-upon-Avon. So we'll, oh, be, yes. we'll be performing there. Yes, well, actually, I was, I was going to say um, uh, about Matthew. So you're 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 coming to the UK for my UK listeners. Um, we're we're international, so uh, yeah. I won't be biased. Um, so you're coming over in, in June, and so that's a revival. So are you starting back from first principles? Are you returning with the same sort of company you started? How did how did Malfi come for you the first time around, as it were? Um, sure. Uh, Dr. Farah Karim uh, had just finished uh, editing uh, her version of Duchess of Malfi for Arden. She was really in love with it. Um, and we wanted a project by which we could start working on um, something that I don't think anybody had tackled quite yet, which was theatrical gesture in the Renaissance slash Jacobian era. And so we decided to go with Duchess because the timing just seemed right. Mm. Um, and um, and yeah, so so we began that project. Um, did it here in Austin to, uh, to surprisingly, uh, just people really enjoyed it. You know, that play is, uh, is so unusual and uh and webster really pulls out all the stops in it you know there's a werewolf in it for crying out loud he yeah. really it reminds me of sort of like an early modern haunted house like a 1960s style haunted house movie hmm. very psychedelic and strange he really um he really uh makes some very odd and interesting choices in it so uh so yes, we will be taking it um, over to the Globe uh, with our with our full team. Um, yeah, so it's just a, a remount. So, 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 but pretty much the same same cast and mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. same principles that you you you, you started with. Excellent. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um. So yes. Yeah, so uh, I mean, the Duchess of Malfi. You're right. I mean, it's 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 there's some very very visceral stuff i mean it is that sort of weird horror film vibe when we get towards the spoiler alert again duchess of malfi doesn't go well for the duchess of malfi listeners um uh, or for that matter some other people quite a few people die right. horribly yep. um but you have this chamber of horrors with waxworks where her brothers who object to the whole idea of her having any autonomy whatsoever are just tormenting her with with uh, people from an asylum and and waxwork effigies of her dead um, children, and mm. and it's just and and that's all just the preamble for for the actual her actual eventual murder. Um, yep. I mean, he goes for it. 
<laughs> really well yeah, just, like you think about it, he's got he's got a severed hand. He's mm. got the works. He's got uh, the you know the madhouse uh, imagery. He's got um, he's got so much murder. And um, and the one thing I noticed that I thought was maybe missing was a magic trick. And I was confused as to why he didn't use a magic trick. And I think I've recently found that he probably did. Um, and I'm trying to work with um, with some scholars right now who specialize in early modern magic uh, to see if we can if we can recreate what I believe is meant to be a magic trick in here as well. Oh, excellent. I like a bit of magic. Um <laughs> I mean, you know, we got. Isn't there, there 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 is a sort of warnings via echoes and 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 things. Um, and Where is it? Yeah, I think it's in the echo scene. There's this... yeah, the 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 <laughs> yes, repeating cogent lines about what what terrible things are going to happen um, towards the end of the play for the the unfortunate uh, husband. So it's been a little while since I watched it. Um, yes. Yes, that's right. Um, she, the, her husband is unaware that she has already, uh, she has already been murdered by this point. He's, uh, and he's walking through a, a cavernous era area, trying to, to make amends with her brothers and hopefully get things back sorted. And, and an echo, uh, it keeps repeating certain lines to try and warn him away. And then he says on the last, on the last echo, I marked none, I marked none of those except the last one in which I saw a light and then a face folded in sorrow. Um, and I'm just thinking that light was probably some type of firework, some type of flash paper, which we know they had, um, ah. and trying to determine whether or not that face folded in sorrow was just the Duchess popping in for a second, but if it was her whole body, then they wouldn't have just said her face. Um, we're just trying to figure out exactly what this magic trick might have been if I'm, or, or I'm completely wrong and there was no magic trick. And, <laughs> and I've done all this research for nothing, but I, I think there was, because otherwise Delia wouldn't say, uh, that, that's just your fancy. Um, that, you know, I didn't see that. There wouldn't have been a need for him to have said that if, if the audience wasn't then wondering, did I see something real or did I see something that is all in our, all of our collective imagination? Hmm. So that's what I'm. So kind of, it kind of goes back to what we do, right? It's sort of this theatrical archaeology, you know, taking taking these little clues and making big choices to try and and um, you know get the time machine humming up and see if we can figure out how we used to tell our stories. Well, I, I, one of the things I always find I'm always surprised with any text, even if it's a reasonably well known play like uh, Duchess of Malfi, is that when you actually start doing bits of it yourself, or you know, or you know, very. Uh, much l less well-known plays um it's just how immediately you go oh i've got all this wrong i've misunderstood this scene you know you read it off a page and you just i always get it wrong <laughs> <laughs> and how much suddenly you have so many options and possibilities that come out of a scene um even scenes that don't look on the page like there's anything really to it or, or uh, and, and and the moment you get it on its feet it's just yeah, you, there's so many things you could do, um, and with a play as you know busy potentially as this, uh, <laughs> it's also that difference in how you deal with the space in terms of lighting um, as well. Is you know that the difference between a shared light experience and uh, and uh, you know more modern conventions mm -hmm. is you know where where does the funny come from? Well, it, when it's a more shared experience, there are more laughs. Um, and it's 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 a fundamentally different kind of show uh, than when you plunge everybody into darkness, uh, and even the funniest comedies die. Um, <laughs> um, I think we've I, I I've looked obviously you've done you've touched on Arden in the past when you were looking at other um, you, you have them down as uh, apocrypha. Um, so looking at Musidorus and uh, Mary Devil of Edmonton, were they rehearsed readings or stage readings that you did in the past? Um, I mean, just thinking about process for Arden of, of, of coming from a, a, a point in the past when it's a reading rather than a full production. Uh, right. Is there a process there? Well, you know, it's the first time we've ever tried that. And what we did is I was really interested in the Apocrypha. And so I, um, uh, with the very kind permission of Eric Rasmussen uh, from, you know, who published uh, with Jonathan Bate 
these, um, you know, these collaborative works. Um, chose those three plays and um, gave them stage readings and just to see, you know, how are they? How do they work? Uh, three, three rehearsals for each one, did a weekend of shows, fully costumed up on their feet. We don't ever do staged readings, just, you know, sitting. We, we stage them. That's, you know, mm -hmm. we, we miss Noma, right? So, uh, you know, characters and usually live musicians. And we really get in there and we play it um, as best we can. Uh, and really, it's just the only difference is that people have scripts in hand and haven't really had the chance to, you know, do deep dives into the work. Uh, we found that Arden of Faversham was far and away the superior play, and I'd always wanted to go back and do it again. And so now I had a little space in the calendar, so so we popped it back up mm. and just really tried to dig in a little bit deeper. I changed the notion of it. I, I actually did something we don't normally do, which is I went ahead and gave it a different setting. I gave it sort of a, at least the hint of a 1961 setting, just sort of the tail end of that of that leave it to beaver era of um, of a nuclear family, or at least the uh, appearance of a nuclear family on the outside um, with, uh, you know, all of the the nastiness sort of bubbling underneath. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, is it, did, did you find there's a, there's a, a difference um, between the, that, that earlier version and, and, and coming through to, to, to this production now or, um, or, was it a matter of sort of refining things that you'd found the first time around? Honestly, you know, because my, my crew works so very well together um, and they know each other so well, um, I have found that it's it, the, it, tonally it's basically about the same and that really the main difference is just for the few actors that we have that are different from the stage reading just because of schedules and whatnot, they're different takes on things and uh you know the luxury of time but basically yeah it's the same show and it's uh it actually got one of my favorite audience reactions uh from the stage reading uh which is somebody actually said they peed they peed their pants they laughed so hard and i wondered why um why that particular audience member had had sort of popped out of their seat um and was scooched way forward because she was just she was really close to me and it's because she peed her pants <laughs> she laughed that hard so did you put that in the publicity at all? Um... I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> she peed. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it really is that funny, I mm. think, this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, but isn't it exciting? I mean, it, it's so frustrating to me when there's so much exciting work that's available and then yet, you know, so many companies just don't, don't take advantage of that and then you kind of are forced to, the same bits pumped out over and over and over again and it's like well i, I could go see your Macbeth again or <laughs> just for kicks you know there's an entire world of material that's out there to be you know to be plums so we we call it the uh, midsummer night's dream event horizon um <laughs> which is when you have a, a very serious either new writing or classics company and they, they spend five ten years working really hard to do you know exciting stuff that's never been seen before and then eventually they just go let's just do midsummer night's dream <laughs> and and from that point on their company identity dissolves um and they uh, just sink into the ether um uh, it's just a black hole that just it's just no all the all, all the chips are down now you know all the bets are off <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get that. Well, for me, whenever we actually do uh, just a straight a straight play anymore that hasn't, you know, that isn't a variant in some way, it's always, it always just feels so much easier because otherwise we're putting in a year, two years of, of research mm. on playing practices to make that thing work, right? Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much for for uh, for coming on the podcast. I'm I'm hope everything uh, goes goes well with the rest of Arden and uh, with the upcoming Malfi. Thank you so much for having me. What a thrill. I had the greatest time talking with you about anything that is not a certain playwright, but other things. It was really fun. Oh, and if anybody is interested, um, they can learn more about us at www.hiddenroomtheater.com. And, you know, come say hello if you see us in England. We'd be thrilled to, uh, thrilled to say hi. And all details will be found on the show notes uh, with this podcast. Many thanks to Beth Burns for sharing their time and discussing Arden and other plays. Sadly, as mentioned earlier, this is all material in the past tense. I don't know whether there will be more to come.
but links to the materials and uh, website is mentioned in the show description so you can find uh, out uh, some more information there you've been listening to the beyond podcast follow us on twitter at beyond shakes support us on patreon at patreon.com forward slash beyond shakespeare or buy us a coffee on ko-fi.com forward slash beyond shakespeare and all that jazz till next time i've been your host robert crichton Goodbye.